The final movement of Symphony No. 9 by composer Ludwig van Beethoven is often referred to as the Ode to Joy. Why so? The Ode to Joy is a poem that is inside this movement by the German poet Friedrich Schiller. So there is actually an interesting story surrounding this piece. What, however, it is that this interesting piece is so interesting that people often forget the significance of this piece in shaping history itself. So as the story goes, Beethoven, while everybody heard that piece being played, Beethoven heard this. Nothing. By the time he was doing this, he was in his mid-50s, and he did not know that this would be his final completed piece. And when he completed it, he demanded that he would conduct this piece. And so he went up to the premiere night, Vienna, with the people of Vienna watching him. And he started conducting, waving his hands around crazily. But what people didn't know was that he was off measures by so many measures that by the time this piece had ended, the performance ended, he was still waving his hands around. And then the co-conductor of this performance turned him around to show him the whole crowd applauding him as if he was some national hero back from war. Well, the people of Vienna were wrong, and they were right. In a way, Beethoven was a hero. He wasn't a hero in the sense of war, but then he did shape history. And as, of course, he was also a hero in music. But how did he shape music? The people of Vienna did not know that night that this piece would be played when the Chilean people were, were protesting against a Pinochet dictatorship. And the people of Vienna did not know that night that this piece would be broadcasted all over Tiananmen Square when the Chinese students were protesting. And what they did not know was that this piece was performed together by East Berlin and West Berlin after the Berlin Wall has been taken down. Good afternoon, my name is Hiro Fu and I am currently a rising senior studying Dominican International School. So before I go deeper into my talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. So like all students my age, I immerse myself in academics, but of course I enjoy some extra curri curriculars such as debate and music most importantly. So how did I come in contact with music? Well. Around six years old, I started playing the piano because my parents wanted me to play the piano, of course. And then in grade one, I picked up the cello and the bow. And I'd like to say that starting from that moment, a fire in me started burning until this very day. But then I'd be lying to you for the purposes of this talk. Because sadly, it didn't. Music to me was always a skill that I had to master because simply my parents wanted me to. And so sadly, by grade six, I dropped piano. And up to this day, I still regret that decision. Music to me was just tunes, melodies, and something to perform. But everything changed, as you see in this picture, a few years ago when I traveled with my parents back to my grandparents' place, a small rural village in the center of Taiwan. So as per usual, it was um, Chinese New Year. And they held this huge celebration in front of a temple. And as you can see, this car is converted into a stage with all the colors and stuff. And I was asked to perform my uncle, who was a host then. And you can imagine how weird it was for me to perform the cello in the middle of a traditional Taiwanese celebration. And so I went up there nonetheless. And I brought out a few pieces that I had practiced before. It was uh, traditional Taiwanese pieces, which I didn't really care about um, what the meaning was. And so I played. And if you've ever been to a traditional Taiwanese temple, you'd know that the first thing that would strike you was the noise and the chaos. There was no way that that crowd could have been silent. And that crowd was full of like elderly people who watched me. And so I performed, and all, all the while I could only think of, let's just get over with this performance. Come on, let's get off stage fast, because I was really nervous playing in front of a crowd. And so I finished, and there was this silence. I was surprised what was going on, I thought to myself. I looked into the faces of some of the elderly people, and I saw tears in their eyes. Tears, did I really play that bad? And so, after I came off stage, I asked my grandparents, my grandparents congratulated me, of course, but then they told me my music reminded those elderly people about their relatives who have not returned home yet. So surprisingly, the pieces I had played were actually pretty sad for a celebration like this. 
And those songs reminded them of their loved ones still out of their village that are yet to be home. So at that moment, I was quite surprised how music was really more than music, as I have said. Music slowly became an instrument of change because it could trigger emotions. And at that moment, I vowed to continue this passion in music. And as I have said, there was no fire there, but certainly, starting from that moment, a fire started. So today, our talk is, has the theme solving for why, which, which to my understanding is solving the world's issues. And so now you may ask me, how does music relate to all of this? How is music going to solve the world's issues? Well, before you ask me that, I ask you in return, what issues are there in our world to solve? So just to name a few, poverty, war, racism, sexism, climate change, and so on. And how can music help this? Well, actually, I have a solution already prepared for you. And it's summed up in a word, basically. Love. I know, some of you must be giggling to yourselves. How can he say love solves everything? Love, compassion, awareness solves everything. And yes, I understand that it's quite naive and abstract. But to come to think of it, yes, you do need love in the case of solving the world's issues. With a little bit of love, you come to care about one another beside you, your neighbors in this global village. With a little bit of love, you come to be aware of each other's differences and come to accept and learn from each other. With a little bit of love, you look around at your environment and you see, oh, we need to do something to change this. And now, my mission today is not to tell you how almighty and powerful love is. My mission is to tell you how to spread that love because we surely need that passion to change the world it is, as it is today. And so, how does this happen? Well, the answer is actually quite simple, as it has already, already been stated 700 years ago by a famous man, William Shakespeare, who in one of his poems, uh, in one of his scripts wrote, if music be the food of love, play on. What does this mean? Well, basically, he means that if music can help love survive, continue to go on, then play on, play the music so that love can keep going on. And how do I bring this to my talk? Well, if love is the answer to all our global issues, well, an abstract answer that pushes forward changes to be made, then what are we waiting for? Crank up that music, play that music, so that love can go on, so we can change the world truly and solve our issues. Now, of course, William Shakespeare puts it quite figuratively. You're thinking to yourself, this kid is saying, fix the world with love and everything. And music, how is this even related? But then, let's look at it in a more biological aspect. So, in bio class, I learned that this is the human brain that controls most of our emotions. Well, all of our emotions. And then, when you hear music, this happens. That red part that lights up is the auditory cortex, where we receive music, the sounds. But does music stay in your head, in your auditory cortex, as just sound? No, this happens just a split second afterwards, or even shorter. This is the frontal lobe where our problem solving and emotions are controlled, as well as many other functions. So, wait a minute. You're telling me music goes in, bam, becomes something else. Emotions. Music directly becomes a trigger for emotions. You're triggering really strong emotions, such as love, hate, anger, and so on. So music actually is becoming more than sounds. Music is actually becoming the triggers to emotions. And what drives forward our actions most? Emotions. So therefore, music drives forward emotions. Emotions force us to act. And that is how we can act on music. So to give you a few examples in history, some of you may be familiar with Woodstock 1969. Woodstock 1969 is a music, was a music festival that took place in America. Well, I was not born then, but then I can tell you from videos I've watched that it must have been really interesting. So what happened then was, then was that the American troops were still in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And these people united in this festival for two reasons and two reasons only. Peace and love, summed up by this symbol. And so, honestly, I do not know how effective 
this event was that changed the course of history. But I can tell you that when I watched a famous clip of Jimi Hendrix walking up to stage with his unique swagger and bringing out his guitar and playing the national anthem, I felt something different. Well, the national anthem was beautiful. Actually, it wasn't. He played the first few verses, and then suddenly he hit it with the worst noises I could ever hear played on a guitar. What was happening, I asked myself. Didn't people love this? Apparently, he made the most awful noises a guitar could make for a reason. And I looked it up, and it turned out that he was mimicking the sounds of the Vietnam War. In that song, I could hear the people crying, the people being burned alive, the bullets being fired, the bombs being set off. And at that moment, I really understood how and why he did this. Music, in this case, was a cry for anti-war movements. It was a cry for peace. And it's music like this that truly pushes forward emotions and makes us want to do things to change it. Another example we can relate to more in Taiwan is the Sunflower Student Movement. The Sunflower Student Movement happened just a few years ago when the student pro students pro uh, united to protest against the government. Due to the political issues, I won't go too deep into what really happened and who was right and who was wrong. But while they stormed the Taiwanese legislature hall, they had one song on their lips that banded them together, uniting them together. It was called Island Sunrise by the Taiwanese local band Fire Extinguisher. Now you're about to hear the piece, a uh, short part of the piece, and then you'll see the lyrics. And you tell me why you think this truly united us all. This piece was broadcasted all over Taiwan through the internet, through radio stations and TV stations. And at the same time, people all across Taiwan were singing this song. And this song went on to, almost be, nom uh, to be nominated, almost win an award in the Music Academy in Taiwan. So what gave this song power? What drives us forward when times were hard? As you have heard, this is a piece that's, that band, uh, this is a piece of, this is a song that banded all of us together and united us in one same cause. So what do I want you to take away from my talk today? Well, easy. Start to accept that music is a viable way to, to push forward actions. Music is an instrument of change. And for parents, do not belittle the power of music and educate this, your children so that they know the importance of music. As a child, I never saw music as this. I would never believe what I was saying today. I think music was just a skill I had to practice every day and every day until I realized the importance. But then I realized that I lost all, all those years where I could have been practicing music, where I could have been educated that music is more than just sounds. And for students, I know most of us already like music, so continue loving music. Music could change your life, could change the world, as I have told you. 
And so I'd like to conclude by reminding you that if music be the food of love, play on. And by all means, play on to change the world. Thank you for your time.